Hello everybody, uh, my name is George Hall and I will be doing one play study, my talk, and I'll be using my Liverage Symmetry one play study as an example. So I hope you've been enjoying this uh, youth conference so far. I uh, hope there's been some good uh, talks so far, obviously, we're sort of only in the beginning right now, but either way, I hope it's been good for you. This is a pre-recorded session, so I'm not recording this live, I'm recording this a, f a few weeks beforehand. So with that in mind, let's get into the talk. Firstly though, if you do not know who I am, I, my name is George Hall, I run the online website and blog Genealogy with George, I'm pretty active on Twitter uh, and Facebook as well locally, I am based in West Yorkshire, which is arguably one of the best places in the world, maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but I run the blog, I do a lot of writing, I've written a book called Liversidge's Finest, uh, which we're going to get onto a little bit today as that's part of my one place study. I am a member of various organisations such as the Huddersfield and District Family History Society and uh, the Society for One Place Studies. I'm fitting all of this around uh, my studies. I'm doing a three year levels, History, Politics and English Language, a uh, local sixth form. And so as this is a youth conference, I thought that would be a good little thing to mention that I'm, I'm only 17, so I'm of the age, if you like. So as we begin this talk, uh, I think it's quite clear that we need to consider what a one place study is because if you're watching this you're new to the genealogy the wider local family history world uh you might not know what one a one place study is you know i certainly didn't i knew that there were one place studies when i started all the way back sort of march time uh, of 2021 but i didn't know what a one place study actually was and so it's defined by wikipedia i thought that was the best sort of definition rather than relying upon People doing one place studies, this is a complete outside perspective. It's defined by Wikipedia as a branch of family history and or local history with a focus on the entire population of a single road village community, not just a single geographically dispersed family line. So basically, in simple terms, you're studying a place. That place can be anything. Its scope and focus can be anything. It's just you're not really studying a family line, a line of descent, a line of ascent, if you like. So as I say here, my own little point can literally be about anything. And I put a Jane Roberts uh, one place study on there. I think that's a very good example of an online one place study. She's doing, I think it's St. Mary's Church down in Batley. The, it's a Roman Catholic church and the War Memorial there. But she's also relating it to the wider Batley community of the town, which is of quite relevance to myself because... I have lots of family from Batley, going back many, many years. In fact, my dad was from Batley. So, so it's been a very interesting read. I also do have a few connections to the Roman Catholic community as well, I think, via online. So again, this is an interesting fact about One Place Study, is even if you don't want to undertake one yourself, please do consider them, because they could be very useful for what you want to do. So as I said, uh, cemeteries, that's mine. We're going to get on to why I did mine and how I chose mine. Uh, Daniel, uh, who's, I think you've heard his talk already, he uh, does one on a town, which is like a geographical administrative term in Ireland. Uh, villages, for example, there was one on the village of Hearts, villages of Hartshead and Clifton, which again, I have lots of ancestry from there, but that one seems to have gone now, but it keeps popping up. And streets, again, street studies. I mean, to an extent, you could also, I suppose, consider house studies, uh, house history. I don't know if that would actually be te technically right, but... I mean, to me, it would fit the definition of you studying a building. I mean, there's people have been doing asylums, uh, all sorts of interesting, you know, little projects on this. But that's so uh, good because if more and more people undertake these projects, even if it's just a little bit, there'll be more and more information available about a wide range of places uh, on a different scale that there would be beforehand which is useful to you as a family historian as a young family historian as well you may find it difficult to get places you may find it difficult to research things especially when you're a beginner and therefore if more and more people are making the information more widely accessible on the internet and by other means that's obviously quite beneficial to us and I think that's one point to consider as we go into this from the perspective of someone who is younger. Of course, that just literally does apply to everyone, do not get me wrong. But as this is the youth conference, I think that's the sort of focus I'll be leading with. Okay, so why do a one place study? 
I think I've sort of hinted upon some of these, but again, the Society of One Place Studies, I'm a member, and we'll get a little bit more into their work. They have a page on the website called What is a One Place Study, and there's a little extract from the new website there, bottom. And I've, I've sort of taken out a few key quotes uh, that I think are very important in considering why you should do one. Firstly, you get to explore people and families, perhaps your own, you never know, in their physical and social context. You're not limited to what the 1861 census, you know, tells you. If you're doing a study of the place, you might find out that there was a disease outbreak in 1862. There was bad weather in 1863. You'll consider where and how your family was living, which I think is very important. Furthermore, a range of sources it mentions. Now, that's important. And this comes into one of the reasons I decided to undertake my one place study. But... If you're trying to develop yourself as a researcher, it doesn't have to be that you're going to become a professional. I think everyone aspires to improving themselves. This is quite a good method of self-improvement. Uh, a range of sources considered will naturally, you know, increase your ability to research a variety of different sources. You'll become more comfortable in using them. And as I'll get into very briefly with my one place study, your research method methods could change because you will be just tracing who's the parents, if, who's the siblings, if you're very good, uh, you'll be tracing people in very different ways, which makes you think out of the box, which, although it might seem, oh, that sounds a bit complex, George, it's really not once you get the hang of it, and you will see an improvement across all aspects of your family history, local history, research. You can better understand the people, be they your ancestors or otherwise, and I think that's also another key point. You're not limiting yourself, you're beginning to truly consider the context of what your family was living in. For example, I very much know the local history of my area. I'm not an expert by any means, but I know the general gist. I've, you know, I've begun to read more and uh, do little bits of aspects of research into individuals. And over the next year or so, I really want to come to terms with what was going on in my area, you know. But if I didn't have a, if I didn't live here, I wouldn't know, you know, go to my ancestors in Sunderland, for example, in Mount Wearmouth, that sort of area. Again, I could be <laughs> horrifically mispronouncing that. I have had to do a lot of research uh, because one of the places, and it's an ace name, it's called Fighting Cock Yard. And if, you know, if there was a Fighting Cock Yard street study, yard study, that would be great for me to consider the context. I mean, we've had to do a little bit of research and it turns out it was literally what was going on. Uh, they'd get two cockles and they'd do like the, the fighting. Uh, so yeah, that I think is a, an, an interesting thing to consider. And going back to you, uh, Jane Roberts' study, I know that that's been very useful for me to consider, you know, even though my family might not necessarily come from this Roman Catholic uh, community in Batley, necessarily all of them, the information she's provided, even if it doesn't specifically apply to, like, their schools, for example, they might go to different schools, it's, if that information is not easily accessible regardless, it's good to look at similar areas, you know, similar villages, to get just a picture, because if you then want to begin writing a blog, uh, writing up your family history, that's useful to consider the context to be able to explore your family's past in a more accurate manner. And I think this is also quite a key, key, key aspect of this, I think. You have full freedom and flexibility, and I think that is so key. You can do what you want, when you want it, and how you do it. I'm relating this back to the youth conference and people who are younger. You might be going through school, you might be taking up part-time jobs, you might have an apprenticeship. And I just want to quickly add, uh, slow myself down a bit, yeah, sorry if I'm going a bit too quick. Uh, but I am coming at this from a British, English, Northern English, Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, <laughs> Kirklees perspective. I understand that uh, different countries will have different you know, leaving ages of education, uh, different access accessibility when it comes to education. So that's to consider as well. But generally, if you're undertaking work, if you're undertaking, uh, you know, education, I will get onto this point, but I would advise you to prioritise that over any family history, over any uh, one place study. I very nearly didn't, coming up to my mocks, which I'm currently doing as I record this, apologies. Uh, and I can tell you that would have been a disaster. And even now I feel like I'm slipping into not doing the revision and actually doing the revision if you're doing history based subjects as I'm doing for example can be actually uh, you know relating into what you want to do in your one place study for example so I think do from a young person's perspective 
having full freedom and flexibility of the scale and scope and being able to change that and not having, you know, deadlines is very, very key because you can fit it into and around your life. And that is very key. So why did, I'm just going to put two questions into here. Uh, why did I decide to do one place study and why did I pick Liversidge Cemetery? And there you go. I've got some pictures relating to the stuff we're doing up at the cemetery. Uh, so as a point I've made before, I wanted to do something more than just my family. You know, there was... A thing I wanted to consider was I am very much working class, working class, maybe a little bit middle class, you know. I want to know working class history. I find that interesting. I don't really care for the lords and the ladies of the manor, you know. We come from a mill owning area, a collier owning area, so everyone knows all the old mill owners. I don't. But actually, as I would later go on, and I was a little explorer, as I'll make a point as I'm bringing up examples of what I've done, I actually in, got interestingly got involved with looking at one guy who was a coal mine, oh no that's a colliery, for example that's uh, the term we use for a coal mine, uh, which is quite local, I think I know where it was, I know where he was living, I went and <laughs> you have to go down like a country road, but I found where he was living back in the day, a nice big fancy house, but he was buried there and actually that was very key, I mean looking into non-conformist records, uh, the Norris Club Congregational Church for example, uh, so that, you know, as we get onto a more records ex example, for example as I said the, the non-conformist records, uh, newspaper records, when I was coming into this, record sets that were familiar to me now were not. Uh, and as I'm saying, I just wanted to do something different. You know, I actually don't do much from this research nowadays. I think I've just, I'm too busy, but I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of research into other people. Uh, but recently, you know, I've got back into it a little bit, but having this one place study in the background is something to do, you know, to fill the gap, to try to get yourself back into your family history, for example. I do have a connection to Liversidge Cemetery. So, firstly, my great-great-grandmother, Betty Totten, is buried at Liversidge Cemetery alongside her daughter, Lucille, who sadly passed away. I think she was about 13 months. I don't know if you can see it, but there's pictures up there. Uh, furthermore, we do have a cousin, uh, Phyllis Riley. My great-great-grandmother was a Riley, and it's like her niece maybe sort of along those lines i don't know if it's like a niece's daughter or whatever i i could find the exact relationship but it doesn't matter she's there so but it's not the biggest family connections you know i realize i should be doing batley cemetery you know if i wanted to go by family connections because everyone's buried there in my family uh but also i'm a volunteer at the friends of oliver city cemetery and i've been doing that since july 2020 uh so just look on to go into them pictures that's me with our group founder tina and another, la another lady sue uh, and that's with us with the hoodies on friends of lewisher cemetery hoodies and then that's me in an early tidy up uh, not below that but when i'm like got gloves on so i actually do do work in this cemetery so you get to know the graves and you go oh i wonder who they were so that was one of the reasons as well because i generally had an interest in finding out more about the cemetery and then that's a picture of me with betty's grave now this isn't related to my one place study but we managed to mark that grave and so the connection you had to have been buried there is even greater because you have actually put that stone there and i feel like that's my responsibility to look after that also i am as i put it a liversidge lad i don't know how, how many people would use that term but i'm from here it's up the road. It's twenty minutes walk. Twenty minutes walk if I can be bothered, but it's up a big hill. If it's a, if it's a bad day, thirty minutes. Sometimes just get the bus up because it's easier. Uh, but yeah, so it is local. I'll also go link into this sort of idea of localism and it being very local. As I've said before, I want to increase my knowledge of local history. I want to know what was going on roughly. And so actually, I think what. A big problem I'm facing when I'm doing this is local history seems to stop at about 1980, if not 1950, 1960, because new books haven't been written since then, really. So actually, as this cemetery has been around since 1903, if you say 1903 to 2003, for example, that's actually increasing, you know, including people that would have been missed off normally. And it's not just as a, from the perspective of the said history books, actually, it's a more broader and more general, and there's, it's random. You, at the end of the day, you don't know who's going to be buried there, whose stories you're going to be looking at to. I would never have known half the stories, you know, but actually doing this, you do increase your general knowledge of how people were feeling. You actually see lots of uh, connections across all sorts of classes, for example, because I do think the class divide as part of my own area is quite important. Uh, Furthermore, I always noticed that there was quite a supportive community, especially from the wonderful Society for One Place Studies. They are amazing people. 
uh, One Place Wednesday, for example, on Twitter is a, a great way to get yourself introduced to the One Place Study community. You know, some people have separate Twitter accounts. I did that once, for example, but I found that as I don't want to just be known by the One Place Study, it's just part of what I'm doing. It was easier to include it as part of myself, and that way I would be able to be more flexible with it, but it's up to you. And generally, I think they are such a supportive community. I've never seen anyone say anything bad about them, uh, so you definitely would recommend it just for the community aspect. And they will be very supportive in you deciding to do one. You know, I certainly was asking about cemetery studies. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was going to do a street study. But actually, the cemetery studies a good idea, for me at least, and it was. Uh, furthermore, the flexibility, and as I've sort of listed here, I don't. I didn't have all of this going on when I started it, but I certainly had GCSEs. I mean, they were cancelled, but we still did important exams that were effectively were GCSEs in all but name. But I also had work, and I began to take more work opportunities up through uh, the summer because I had the summer off. But right now, for example, I have work. I have sixth form. I have my personal genealogy. I have my blog. I go to a the history group, for example, every other Monday, and other local history groups and volunteering work at like the cemeteries and stuff, you know, that's a lot to juggle. And not all of it's going on at once, it's not all happening in one day. But then consider I've got mocks coming up, you know, revising takes a long, long time with a lot of content in air levels. So you find that I would prioritise work, six form blog, volunteering, local history groups, and then my personal genealogy. Well, how would you fit a one place study into that? Well, the truth is I've been doing bits and bats of it, but it hasn't been a priority at all. And that's completely fine. And we'll get on to why that is and what I've done and what I haven't done. And I should have researched how to pronounce this, but I'm not a taffophile, I think it is. Don't judge me for that. Uh, I'm not one that likes graves necessarily. I like what the graves represent. I like the stories they represent. I think I see, you know, doing the cemetery study. I mean, it's kind of ironic for me to say this. Maybe I'm sort of fighting a losing battle arguing this, but I see the grave as a representation of someone's life, and I don't see it as oh, I'm interested in the you know the architecture of the grave. Oh, I suppose it would be designing a better word. I'm more interested in the people, the letters, the name, the dates. That's what I'm interested in. But you could call me one, I don't know. I just personally wouldn't. So finding out what I wanted to do, and that's the grave of Jeremiah Jackson, who we'll get onto in a sec. Uh, it must have been Mother's Day 2021 when I just had the brief idea that I wanted to do something like this. I began to, uh, f there's a little circular bit of the cemetery, and I'd photographed all the graves from there. And I wanted to photograph all the graves going up at a time, you know. I thought, well, I'll have plenty of time to come up an hour a day or something. I don't drive, and even though it's a 20 minute walk, I don't have enough time or patience to do that. And I think as I began the summer, I had great ideas for what projects I wanted to do. My summer ended up being very much just going into Leeds to the Mates every Tuesday, going up to Marley Cemetery on a Monday, Wednesday, doing nothing, working rest of the days. Um, so actually, I didn't have enough time, actually. I didn't have the patience to do that either, because that's that takes a lot of work. Uh, to do all of that and then record them as well and in why what means would I record them so back to the drawing board and we're going back to the coal miner family here the mans I researched him lots came up because lots have been uploaded and I was introduced to the noise top congregational church records on um, ancestry they are again there's some of the non conformist records are all scanned in but they're all done weirdly because they're like all sorts of gems on there about the church so if you ever wanted to do the research into the church that would be lovely but I was introduced that family were quite prominent in it, loads of lovely pictures, but then instantly I realised that this family, despite its wealth, they were absolutely plagued by death. Uh, for example, the daughter, sadly, in, ta died during a school trip. I don't know the circumstances behind it, but she's buried there. Uh, two of their sons, as we're going to, they're included in my book, they died during the First World War, sadly. Uh, I actually think, oh, this man of such privilege, well, he lost his son and then spare. You know, the heir to the family and the spare to the family wealth. I don't know what happened to it after that. I think there might have been another son. Uh, it might have not been. But that's awful to go over the space of, what, 10 years, I think it was, and to lose two of your children, three of your children, one daughter to just a chance at freak accident and two of them to a war. I think that was very good for me to see that. I might just be a little bit uh, biased against these people, not in, like, a prejudicial way, but... I think that I'm just naturally sort of patriotic, if you like the word, towards working class people because it's where I came from and I feel like there's so many of them it's hard to tell every single one's stories accurately. 
uh, and the Litchfield founders as well. He was a soldier, and he I got a picture of him, and he was buried next to Betty. He's also in my book, and then on the other side of Betty, there's also another soldier. He wasn't buried there actually; they were both commemorated. But it's just easier to say buried. Uh, anyway, I don't know how I found this grave, why I found this grave, but I found the Jackson grave, which is there. I just it's a little bit on the messed up side of it, but I found it a very interesting grave. Uh, because just this Jeremiah died when he was about 24, and I was just thinking, the way this is, you know, this Harriet was mentioned, his wife, and then his parents are buried on it, but Harriet's not buried there. What were the circumstances? Now, I think I'd already made the connection that Harriet most likely, and rightly so, remarried after the death of Jeremiah, hence the reason she's not buried there. But that wasn't necessarily going to be the case. But this led to the first blog post on my... The first blog post, and the only blog post today, actually... Uh, and it's honestly not my best piece of work. Looking back at that, I could rewrite that ten times better. Uh, on Jeremiah Jackson, it was named Diadem to Death. It was released on the 22nd of June, 19... 2021. Sorry, it's family day, 1982, so a bit biased there. But that was a good way to launch the study to the wider public and really sort of lodge my interest in the cemetery and the people there's history in other people's minds. Now we're moving on to what I'd call the second phase, if you like. This is when stuff really took off for me. And actually, I think a lot of the wider public, you know, people interested in the one plus study, won't know half the stuff I've done because I haven't got around to publishing it yet. But again, we'll get on to that. Firstly, I wrote a book. More on that later. I want to get into that as a good example, good case study of, I think, important things to consider, especially from a young person's perspective in the, the, sort of the wider one plus study community but i began re research into the registrars of the cemetery and that was just by pure luck a friend's third great granddad was the cemetery registrar which was a great coincidence furthermore uh, i came across uh, a case of fraud which you can see down there there's another point and that's been interesting to research and i know a potentially a connection to someone who might be related to them so before i write that up i want to try get into contact with them to send them the information and try see if it's okay by them uh, and also the cemetery registrars, uh, and I visited the wonderful West Yorkshire Archives, Huddersfield Branch, uh, to learn more about the early days of the cemetery. The, I really wish I'd got also the council notebooks as well because I'm missing it, but I've got the cemetery committees and sort of notebooks, and so I was able to, you know, consider the fact that they considered multiple architects that picked Rhodes, who is the architect, so we'll get on to him a little bit. I've got a list of all the equipment they originally went to the shop and bought, for the registrar's uh, sort of house, all sorts considered. The guy that was originally point appointed, you know, day when it was opened, you know, letters sent by churches, like you need to make sure one half's consecrated. So there was all sorts going on, really. I spent too long on the British Newspaper Archives website and on my Chrome online. Uh, there is folders and folders of references to Livingston Cemetery. Some of them death notices, some of them like were literally saying it was opened last week. As I said, investigated that case of fraud and went up to Clark Eaton Library to go look physically, excuse me, physically look at the local newspapers despite having a wide array of uh, reportings from Aberdeen to down somewhere down south. Uh, I sent off for the scans of the cemetery chapel and the actual cemetery itself and some other thing he did, he did some road works as well relating to the release of the cemetery from Mr. Alfred Ernest Rhodes. He was the architect. And interestingly, I was introduced by some people who are fellow volunteers and also local history experts, uh, that he was actually buried at the cemetery and Rhodes' grave has the little lovely inscription on it, architect of this God's Acre. And that was very interesting. I want to know more about him. The catch here, and if you do follow my work, you'll probably be surprised to say, oh, you've done all of that. I might have tweeted about it, but I have just simply haven't had the time to write and organise all of this. And... From my perspective, although at first I might have put myself under pressure for this, that's completely okay. And, you know, no one's going to come back and haunt me. I would rather do the project justice, rather do everything justice than rush it. And I would especially urge you to adopt this mindset. As I've said, if you're in, you know, important stages of education, but if also if you're 13, you do not want to put yourself under unnecessary and undue stress and pressure. You've got to look after yourself, especially when you are so young, you should be exploring your life, you should be exploring your identity, you should be exploring your passions, you shouldn't be putting yourself under pressure, you're not a professional yet, and I don't mean that in a demeaning way, as we'll get on to that, I think there's an important discussion to be had behind that, 
But you know, your income isn't necessarily going to be dependent upon your one place study. Your happiness shouldn't be either. You should not put yourself under unnecessary stress. You need to look after yourself. Now, I don't think many people would, but I know that people might need to hear this for other aspects of their life. This is an important message to be had. And again, trust me, I have been there. I am very stressed right now. I've got a lot going on right now, you know. But that's that's things adding up and that's life. But don't be putting yourself under stress for the sake of being under stress. Uh, you definitely do not want that. So this is what I would say lessons for other young people. As I've said, do not rush and you don't need stress. And I will stress that again. When you're young, you should be taking it really as an opportunity to explore your identity, who you are as a person and what your interests are. You might start at one place where you might then lose interest in genealogy. You know, it's, I started when I was sort of 15-ish. Uh, just turned 15 so actually it's been two years later now i think i i went through stages of world building i went through all sorts of different stages when i was younger uh, the truth is they've developed who i am and my interests today but genealogy hasn't been a stage genealogy has evolved with me but genealogy is the passion i have and i found that passion and i've stuck with it and thank god i stuck with it uh, you might not find that with genealogy genealogy just might be something another passing fad for you and you know what? That's fine. That is absolutely great. And I, I genuinely found that in the one place study community specifically, most people are supportive. There was a big debate online now about age-based discrimination. I think Daniel's talk talks about building a bridge uh, between generations. I haven't heard anything about it yet. So I'm very much looking forward to hopefully listening to it before I have a, you know, what, I'm waiting for mine to come online. Uh, but I have... Well, just generally, I've never, you know, this big debates over age-based discrimination in the genealogy and I suppose wider local history, sort of research community, I suppose, in one place study. I've never faced this. I, uh, you know, I, I've spoken to people aging from ages 13 to 80 in relation to this and not a single person has necessarily met my age an issue. I mean, some people have been surprised uh, that I've been so interested, that I've done so much stuff related to this. And some people take that as being offensive. I don't. I think that there was always going to be this age divide because actually it's still quite a niche hobby for young people. And I think that is down to a multitude of different reasons. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily down to the idea of age-based discrimination personally. I think people are interested in their roots. And I use my mother as an example. I went to her, so you are interested in your family history, are you? She said, yes. So I said, it's just the idea if you scroll them through page by page, the 1841 census, which is not appealing. And she said, yes. So I find that people are interested in family history. It's just that, and also wider local history and one place studies, for example, it's just that they don't want to do the research. And I would like to also consider another aspect I personally have seen. I think there is a professional... Oh, <laughs> A professional versus professional divide, George. I suppose that's the way to put it. What I mean by that is, I think some younger people are challenging the idea that, you know, their experiences with genealogy have to be more professional based. I think generally I take the professional mindset. Me as a person on Twitter and genealogy in family history and local history groups is very different to me as a person with my friends. Uh, I'm not being fake, it's just I personally want to promote a different image of myself, you know, than I would with at school. That's just sort of how it is. I see this as a professional area. I think I see this as a way to increase my skills and confidence uh, in just everything. And I take it seriously. You don't have to. And what I'm trying to say is I don't think you should be compelled to. And perhaps this is where the age-based discrimination comes from. And it's not age-based discrimination. And I would also consider that age-based discrimination can come from anywhere, from anyone. Uh, we can or not as a community be helping young people, but then detract that from older people. And I use older people. I don't know what would be the best way to refer to people who are perhaps retired, you know, over 70, 80. I don't want to offend anyone. I personally wouldn't say people in the 70s are old because my grandma and granddad are in, my they're in the 70s. And I don't want to say that about them. So for me, you have to be 100 to even be considered old. And even then, maybe not. But, you know, are people they're that age going to want to break this down? Perhaps not. So I wonder if there isn't, if the discrimination is based upon mindset, 
And if there is a divide of that mindset, it's reconciling both sides and realising that it's not that deep. Some people see this as a hobby, some people see this as a profession. I see it as a combination. I also think that you need to put yourself out there, and I think this is such a key, 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 you know, I've stressed that quite a lot there. If I hadn't have put myself out randomly and joined the other branch team when I was messaged, which I very nearly didn't, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have written a book. I would, And if I had written, written my book, it wouldn't have been as successful as it was. I wouldn't have discovered my passion for writing, you know, writing generally from my blogs is what I've discovered. I wouldn't have the skill set. I wouldn't have made the connections. I, in many ways, wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for putting myself out there, which is something I'm very proud of myself for doing. I've always been a person that can do this. I I think I've benefited from the way my mum brought me up. My mum and dad, they used to always take me out to little playgroup things and just shove me out there and be like, I'd be like, oh, I don't want to go. And be like, you've got to do it. So, and also as a lonely, as a lonely child, a little bit of a slip there. I don't mind being an only child, but as an only child, you get used to making entertainment for yourself. And I think some confidence comes from that. So I understand not everyone has confidence. People might be scared. They might have anxieties. So you don't have to put yourself out there in such a big way. Be become a public figure. I'm not saying I am a public figure, but you get what I mean. But just put yourself out into the community, and you'll realize how supportive they are. If you do have anxiety, you do have fears. Make sure that, you know, you're telling the community that and they will be absolutely supportive, I'm 100% sure. Uh, be prepared to work hard if you want results and this is really what I want to stress. And there's, I hope you read this big flashing notice. I don't want to list everything I've done in like a bragging manner. Say, oh, look at me, because that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to provide examples to you to see what you can do in a one place study. I hope that and it was to me seeing people do things, especially Daniel, he was very in, much an inspirational figure to me back in the day. He still is, don't get me wrong, but to, to different levels. But back in the day, seeing like, yeah, genealogists like uh, Catherine from the Hidden Branch, uh, PJ Elias as well. Sorry, PJ, if I said your last name wrong. And just among, amongst many others, uh, I think that... Uh, that was inspiring to see these people out there doing genealogy and writing blogs and reading them was just so inspiring to me back in the day, as I say, two years ago, if not, no, a year ago, to start genealogy two years ago. Uh, and I want to do that if possible, if that's useful to some people to see that you can do things, you know. I, I didn't just sit down, as I said, I didn't just sit down and do nothing to write a book and get those documents. I went out, I did the work, spent my days in the holidays, uh, <laughs> going to archives now I found that fun but that's uh, each their own as my mother would say uh, and also I think another key 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 lesson is you, you can fit your life into your passion you know my book was my EPQ project at school and it, you know that I'll get a grade on that and that'll help me get UCAS points uh, to get into uni I merged two ideas there together and made an, and I was lucky that I was able to you know do that if I'd have done an EPQ project on top of the book the book wouldn't have wouldn't be done by now it might have just been done uh, but it was a good way of as we'll get on to you know getting into the book it was just a good way of doing things for me via the project and also li linking into the school holidays now i'm gonna hurry up a little bit now there you got melanie pearson a lovely lovely person i met through the friends of lucy cemetery she was the first person and I, I met i made the conscious decision to go up to see her because i thought she was the first person and she'd love to be the first person receiving my book and that's a picture i must have said i've stolen off twitter from her the Huddersfield Family District Society uh, regarding my book. Uh, there was a really good picture they took, so we like that one, so we're using that one now. This is the timeline uh, of roughly the events that happened. Uh, and you got to understand as I undertook this, sort of doing this, I was doing it alongside my EPQ project, so actually things were a little bit different because I had other things to contend with while I was doing it. So the idea came to me in July 2021, but I had the idea for the book, uh, doing a book, we get late into my family history, sort of like writing mini blog posts, I suppose, uh, years ago, I, mean, I started, I thought it would be good, I have a title, I'm not sharing the title, because one day I will write that book, but uh, the idea of the cemetery came to me when I was at work in the steel yard in uh, July, about July 2021, I sent off a message to the group chat of the cemetery group, they were all very supportive of the idea, they thought that was a lovely idea to be doing, because it would help the group as well. As it would come on, we decided to actually not donate it, these profits to the group, but to the Commonwealth Wargrave Society. Not Wargrave Society Foundation, the fact the group's foundation was more appropriate, but 
originally it was to help the group and I emailed my teachers, they were supportive of changing it. So I began the research process shortly afterwards. I should say I was very lucky because a lovely member of our group, Jane Cantrell, had actually gone round through the lockdown and found all the wild graves because we do hold Remembrance Day services. So we wanted to make sure that we were honouring all the soldiers, you know. And I, as I was doing it, I would find three or four more graves, you know. Obviously, I don't blame her. You're walking through a cemetery with loads of graves, you're going to miss out some. But I had the names already, and I went and found all the graves and stuff. So I've been to every single person's grave, actually, which is interesting. It's about 30 or 40 I've been to, but I have. And I came back into school in September after losing focus in August. I wrote, began writing the, the actual book that late August period. Now, if I'd have kept up it through August, I would have been in a much better stage and I would have got it out by Remembrance Day. I definitely would have done. Uh, if I'd have finished it by mid-September, uh, writing it, got it proofread as I was doing the project, I would have got it out by my original deadline, which was the Remembrance Day service. Originally, I was going to sell it. I was going to buy X amount of copies and flog them off during the service. Uh, I say service, more of an event for the Cemetery on Remembrance Sunday of that year. What I ended up doing, as we'll get on to it, is I decided actually using Lulu, it was a more flexible online printer. It was actually a bit more difficult in the sense it was American-based, so it wasn't like the local firm, which we were originally going to go with. But I liked the design, it was very helpful in me designing it, but I was able to get an X amount of copies. I could order one if I wanted to, or I could order 54. So I was able to get sort of an exact amount, so I had orders, so I wasn't losing out money as I was funding this myself. But after I came back to school, I really became more disciplined and focused in writing this book. I really mean that. I wrote it from a free period, my private studies where I've got to stay in school. And past eight o'clock, I would just be writing, 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 checking, 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 research, research, and researching. I went to the libraries to get newspaper information on them. I had to go through years upon years upon years of the Spen Guardian. Not complaining, but when you've got a limited amount of time, an hour and now two hours to do this, it gets stressful. I took multiple trips to the libraries. I also used school... I uh, also use the school library as a great resource as well. I experiment in terms of design and publishing it. And it was announced in late December 2021 and the first copy was sold in late January 2022 to Melanie. Now that was a summary. I really am going to hopefully do a talk in the future on my book. Really going into the graphs and details and if you're interested I will you know, definitely make sure to publicise it if I do do a talk on it. But my lessons learned were that plans will and can change. And I think this is especially important when you're younger. You might not have the experience when you're doing projects that things don't go swimmingly. You know, the idea of a duck, you know, proper flapping its feet or legs or whatever. I think that's a key thing to consider. And I was lucky to finance it because I work, you know. And I would argue that finance is not a youth issue. Finance is an issue age 5 or 105. And from putting myself out there, working hard and keeping a positive mindset throughout as I put many difficult challenges and chat difficult hours and challenges, I always had a dream of publishing a book when I was younger and I did it. I'm proud of myself for doing that. I very, you know, rarely say stuff like that, that's not the person I am, but I am proud of myself. And in summary, just please try to be comfortable putting yourself out there and to an extent taking risks. I was lucky I got offered financial help when it came to publishing the book. You know, some people said, if you need us to buy it and then you give us the money back and then you take the profits and donate them, we can absolutely do that for you. I was just lucky I had enough savings to do that. Uh, and I was privileged to actually be able to donate it. You don't feel like you have to do all this for charity work. At the end of the day, I put lots of work into this book. So in many ways, I deserved to pocket the money, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something positive with this work. In And the, I didn't see this book as something for me. I saw this book as something for the soldiers and their stories and remembering them. And therefore, I thought they wouldn't want me to keep it. They'd want it to go to looking after their graves in France. So in conclusion... One place studies are very, very fun, uh, especially if you want to, you know, as we've said, increase your scope of research and be very flexible. There's a supportive one place study community and Twitter and other social medias, and especially the society is very inclusive of younger people. I believe they offer discounted or free memberships. I can't remember exactly which one it was. I think it was free. Now, I actually, uh, they actually contacted me because I paid and, you know, tried to change it, but I just thought I can pay. Uh, I honestly feel like let that money go towards your society in being able to enable other young people to do that. So they, they, you know, they actually were going out their way to give me money back because it was free for young people. They really are that supportive. So, you know, <laughs> thank you. But 
I want to help support the society in any way I can, and I that know that I am lucky when it comes to my finances, and I would rather that money went to funding some other young person, you know, perhaps are a lot younger in uh, uncovering their passion for a place and research. And I manage this one place really around my time, and I'm hoping to get out some more content about it. If I do, I do. If I don't, I don't. No one's going to die. Lots can be achieved, even if you don't have that much time, you know, as long as you work hard. And I'm not saying you've got to sit here, write billions of notes, you know, be someone you're not. In many ways, I kind of find it funny that I've done everything I've done with this one place study. Actually, looking back at it, it is just kind of funny because there wasn't such, you know, wasn't you spending my entire life on it. I just sort of did it for fun. And I think this is especially aimed at Ross as our audiences, as I've said. Do not ruin any other chances in life over a one place study. Do not get too stressed. Just focus upon school, work, then your one place study or genealogy. And finally, the message I really want to leave in conclusion is reach out and make your mark. It is your time, it is your opportunity, age 5 or 105, to do something. There was a good quote, I think it was by Judge Judy of all people, and she said, uh, you know, if you haven't made it when you're 20, you can make it when you're 30. If you haven't made it when you're 30, you can make it when you're 40, so on, so on. Do that. You might have had a bad year last year, you know, if this is a way to make your life better, do it. If you don't put yourself under pressure, just do it. You know, I suppose it's a bit of a meme for those younger people, just do it back in the day, but that's the talk, that's the conclusion. At the end of the day, all of this comes from putting yourself out there and allowing the community to support you, so please do do that. I hope this talk has been of some use to you. I hope of all ages it's been interested. I hope points considered can be discussed further. And I would just recommend you all to start at one place today if you haven't. So my name was George Hall. I run the blog Genealogy with George. Uh, I have the one place study of Liversidge Cemetery. And that's sort of me summarised. And I want to thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. I'm sure it's going to be very informative, insightful. And just interesting to hear so many different perspectives. Thank you.